So just so we're kind of clear wh where I'm speaking from on, on this topic, um, I am a molecular biologist by training. So that that is, you know, my brain does think a lot as, as, a, as a scientist. But I also have a pretty um, strong sort of spiritual practice to my life. And a lot of it centers around nature. Um, I feel deep relationship and kinship with nature. And so a lot of my work is also really inspired uh, by that relationship and thinking about ways that we can integrate perhaps really responsible, just technology use in a way to create a more brighter future for, for ourselves and all the other species and non-human beings that we share this planet with. And so that's where I'm coming from. And really what I hope today is to, to share with you and, and educate you all on how this technology works, educate you on sort of where we stand now with making decisions about whether or if we should use this technology or how, and really try and present to you some things that I think are really important um, anchors for conversations about this technology. And so to kind of step back a little too, not only am I a huge you know, lover of nature, my, my, real, my real special place in nature is with trees. I feel really deep connection with trees. And I've suffered quite a lot of grief in watching what's been happening to our planet, and particularly to many of those tree species uh, that share our planet with us. In the US, we have situations where we have um, lodgepole pine that are being, being killed off by pine be boring pine beetles. We have a situation where we have uh, hemlocks that are dying at incredibly high rates. Beach are under threat from rust, uh, rust and different beech bark diseases. Um, and another one of my favorite trees under threat is the ash. And I know that in this country, you also are losing your ash at really fast rates. Ash dieback is killing, killing ash trees in this country. Um, it's predicted that over 95% of ash may, may perish to this disease. Um, in the US and parts of Canada, we have this beautiful beetle called the emerald ash borer, which has come over from Asia, and it's killing all our ash. Hundreds and millions of ash trees have died in North America already. It is predicted that there may be very few ash trees left by the end of my lifetime. They die within two to three years of infection. This breaks my heart. And, um, and I feel really passionate about thinking ways that we can try and save some of this huge, immense loss of life. One molecule could be part of that solution, and that's CRISPR. CRISPR allows for what's called gene editing. And gene editing is this new version of genetic engineering that's quite inexpensive, easy to use, and very specific in how it works. So up until now, most genetic engineering techniques have resulted, for example, in huge swaths of DNA being changed in the process of making a genetic change. CRISPR has been likened to like genetic scissors in that you can go into the DNA of, of literally any little living thing and change it to the very single base, base pair of the code of DNA. Th this is pretty, this is significant, this is big. And we're seeing CRISPR emerge in all sorts of places, whether it's hum healthcare, whether it's industry, agriculture. And we're also seeing it starting to emerge in places where generally genetic engineering would have been cross prohibitive or too difficult, places like public health and environmental conservation. And the way that it works, because I think this is important, just I need to, I'm going to give you a quick science lesson so we can all be on the same page and then you can go to your next dinner party and just really blow everyone's mind. <laughs> um, but basically CRISPR is so easy to use because it really only requires two components. One is this little blue guy, which is called the guide RNA. So the guide RNA is going to be a specific sequence that can recognize whatever sequence of the DNA that you're trying to change. So if that sequence of the DNA perhaps has the single base change that causes sickle cell disease, you would create the sequence that recognizes that to go to that mutation and, and want to change it. And so the guide RNA localizes the place of DNA that you want to change. And this, which looks much different in real life under microscopes, is a, an enzyme called Cas9. And what this does is it cuts DNA. This is an absolute nightmare for any cell. When its DNA is cut, it wants to repair it immediately. And so what you can do is you can kind of usurp that DNA repair process by introducing a DNA template of whatever you want to introduce into this genetic sequence. It could be changing the sequence. It could be adding an entirely new sequence. It could be removing sequence from the DNA. And by doing that, the DNA gets repaired, introduces the change, and voila, you have an edited gene. Obviously, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but this is sort of 
really how it works, and this is what's, this is what's become so revolutionary in the genetic engineering space. As I mentioned, the ease of use of this has allowed it to be entering into totally new ways of solution making or things that we previously would have been thinking it couldn't be effective for. Agriculture is one. I think we can all kind of jump to the quick conclusion of what this is looking at. This is thinking about using this for genetically engineered crops, thinking about using this to remove certain pests. Um, environmental conservation is another. So for example, people are discussing, could we use CRISPR gene editing to give coral different kinds of genetic sequences that make them resilient to warming sea temperatures? Could we use CRISPR gene editing to suppress the emerald ash borer by introducing sterility into that population in North America and saving the ash tree? Could we use CRISPR gene editing to remove invasive species like the mosquitoes in Hawaii that are, that are spreading avian malaria to threaten bird species? Or the, our friend here, the cane toad that is causing quite a lot of destruction in Australia. The other places this being explored is within the public health space. So there's discussions around, can we use CRISPR gene editing to, to suppress the malaria species, the malaria carrying species of mosquito, potentially saving 500,000 lives every year. Um, ideas around using it to remove species of mosquitoes that carry dengue fever, Zika fever, chikungunya. So this is some big, these are really big ideas and it's, and it's, not, it's not fully theoretical anymore. I think that's important that we all understand sort of the status of where this is. Some of this is still kind of at the very early stages. The coral projects, for example, are still very kind of in the idea stage and proof of concept. Is it even possible? But we already have, for example, mosquitoes that have been genetically engineered using ways that predate CRISPR by a company called Oxitec, which has been releasing these mosquitoes in Brazil, the Cayman Islands, Panama, parts of Southeast Asia to try and suppress that population of mosquitoes and, and then hopefully suppress dengue transmission. There's been an American chestnut tree that has been genetically engineered in the US. American chestnuts went functionally extinct in the US about around the turn of the 19th century. And so there's been ideas about creating these genetically engineered trees that would be resilient to an invasive blight that killed them all off. And these are already in regulatory approval process, trying to release them to be able to reproduce and spread in the wild and, re, and re, uh, regrow Jehesonus forests. And the one that I want everyone to also be aware of is this project that's funded by the Gates Foundation. This is an uh, initiative called Target Malaria. And they are using CRISPR gene editing to create a, a line of mosquitoes that when released into the wild would suppress the mosquito population that carries malaria and hoping to save human life. And they do this because not only does CRISPR allow you to make really easy gene edits in any living thing, it's also allowed for the production of what's called a CRISPR-based gene drive. Because if you think about it, if anyone remembers their natural bio their biology training from way back when, things work through natural selection, right? So if you're going to release a, a mosquito that has some gene in it that you want to push through a species population, it's going to go mate with a wild mosquito. There's going to be only 50% of inheritance of those genes. And eventually, through natural selection, it's quite likely that mosquito would get pushed out of the population. And you wouldn't really change anything. What a gene drive does is this gene drive mosquito not only expresses the gene edit that you want. So say it's to push sterility through this mosquito spot population to suppress the population. It also expresses all of the tools, the CRISPR, so the Cas9, the guard RNA, the stuff that we talked about on that previous slide, so that it makes those very same edits in the wild gene that it inherits from, from its wild parent. So this gene drive mosquito is going to mate with the wild, wild parent. The child inherits the gene edited gene from the gene drive parents, as well as the CRISPR, to then edit the same gene in the wild parent. And through that, you get 100% of inheritance of a gene. And over time, every single mosquito in a population will have that gene edit that you acquire. And this is the game changer. This is what's both exciting, because it means you can transform populations of, of species if you're trying to try and create a solution for something. It's also what's incredibly frightening. You can completely alter a, na a natural wild species by releasing just a few of these gene drive mosquitoes. And I want you to hold those, try and hold those two ideas at once because we're really early in the conversation. And just so you know, I sit in the middle too, where I, both this is exciting and also scares the crap out of me. And so I think that's where we're going to try and stay so we can really continue this, this conversation. Because a lot can go wrong, OK? So yes, there's amazing possible benefits. We could save the coral reefs, possibly. We could save 
you know, hundreds and thousands of human lives every year. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot here that could be really wonderful if it works as we expect and it's designed responsibly, right? There's a lot that could go really badly. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.